Welcome to session six, the last session of the, this workshop. And um, we have several panelists here. And the way the session is going to work is that each panelist will introduce uh, his or herself and maybe make some proactive remarks that are not reacting to what we've heard, but just some things that the speakers themselves are bringing to the table to begin with. And then we'll have some discussion of the things that we've heard during the conference. We're trying to pull together some themes and some common uh, um, uh, requests and desires that uh, where we feel we can make some progress. And we also want to open the floor to discussion at that point. So uh, let's begin with Sasha, Sasha Slavkovich. Okay, great. Um, I guess I'll take my mask off for a moment. Can you hear me okay? Is working? Yes. Okay, terrific. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, uh, it's really uh, a great set of talks uh, yesterday um, and today. Um, and I personally have learned a lot, even though I've been in statistical data privacy research for a long time. Um, so um, as Cynthia said, my name is Alexandra Sasha Slavkovic. I'm a professor of statistics. And my primary research interest is in combining tools from statistics and computer science to enable broader data sharing that supports public policy and scientific reproducibility. Um, and um, we, I worked in many different uh, data contexts and, and data areas, and I have experience with traditional statistical disclosure limitation methodology, and as well as differential privacy, and in particular, um, um, I'm trying to work at the interface of um, differential privacy um, and, and um, with, you know, thinking about specifically how do we enable valid statistical inference as we support broader data sharing. Um, so a couple of uh, general remarks. I think this is my um, <laughs> favorite slide that I give pretty much in any talk that I give. Um, these days, uh, you know, we, we have heard from many different stakeholders. Uh, we are, I think, already in this room all agree that data landscape has changed from, and I, when I say has changed, I go back and think, you know, 1960s, what some of the original statistical disclosure limitation methodologies were proposed. Um, and the, the point that I want to make is that we do have new formal mathematical tools. Specifically, we all talk about differential privacy these days, but uh, um, uh, there are many relaxations of differential privacy in terms of the definitions, but let's just call them more uh, formally, formally uh, private mathematical tools and algorithms. Um, I think the important point that I want to make is that that noisy up the data, just like the old statistical disclosure limitation tools did. I'm calling them old not because they're old, just because they pre predated, uh, uh, let's say, differential privacy, what we call formally private tools. The difference is that, uh, as some points have been made on this already, that the new uh, noising up process is supposed to be um, transparent and it's quantifiable from, from statistical perspective, uh, um, depend, depending also on the complexity of the algorithm. Uh, but what I mean by that is we typically know the exact algorithms, the parameters of the algorithms, and that for statisticians in a room is a good news. Right? We, we should be able to account for noise due to privacy by using measurement error models, uh, robustness, likelihood-based inference, using tools that we already have in our arsenals. Okay? And another thing that I want to make, uh, a, a point that I want to make is that quantifying uncertainties is central to scientific enterprise and is central to developing effective formal privacy methods. We quantify uncertainties every day, and the form of privacy just brings another dimension of this uncertainty. Okay? And so we shouldn't be afraid of thinking in that direction and, and being afraid of uncertainty and quantifying uncertainty. Okay? And most important for me, I want to quantify uncertainty because I want to make sure that the inferences we get valid inference, our statistical valid inferences are important because they will lead hopefully to right policy decisions. So um, data utility, usability, transparency, yes, what I just said is very nice, hopefully, you know, at a high level, but we know that the, the picture is much more complex. There are many stakeholders 
There are many um, different characteristics and uses of the data themselves and the uses of the data. Um, how do we communicate the data that differs in theoretical statistics, in applied statistics, uh, in, in survey methodology, in computer science, theoretical computer science. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? And, and including stakeholders, you know, when, when you go and talk to the um, people in, in, in the government who truly have to set the certain policies, right? How do we communicate it uh, at, at these, okay? Again, none of that, that's all important, right? But the, my point here on, on the rest of the slide is that there are certain things that we do need to think about when we start uh, um, developing new tools or thinking about even the old tools and reevaluating the old tools, right? The inferences, again, for me, that's a key concept here. Valid inference has to remain valid inference, regardless if I'm working with the original data or I'm working with some noisy up data, okay? That often means, and maybe I'll get to the point later, maybe we need to develop new tools. But that's what we do every day. That's how research happens. That's how theory and practice get bridged, right? We develop new tools. We, dis we have a lot of discussions. We explore. We test, right, in order to ad also adapt things as needed to the practical problems, right? And I think what we heard uh, um, that users want granularity. So why? Well, we all, again, have many different questions to ask, many different questions to, to answer. Uh, we are used to having and being able to do exploratory data analysis often just than simply working with summary statistics. So we have to think about those. If you think about noisy measurement file, right, we're providing statistics, but there are many other, I mean, we heard from, from this morning talks, right, we are thinking about broadening, broadening date, that and providing actual data uh, um, to, to users, and again, regardless if we're talking about synthetic data from statistical disclosure uh, literature or synthetic data with formal privacy guarantees. Um, somebody yesterday uh, said something about, or maybe this morning actually, was it Daniel, mentioned sufficient statistics, right? So again, another important principle tool in statistics that we use and can use when we think about how to support a valid inference. And, and, and again, this can be translated in, in the formerly private framework. Not always easy, right? But that's why we are here. That's what we're trying to do with our research. And we want to have ability to, to assess the goodness of model fits. Um, Claire alluded to a little bit, talking about confidence intervals, but also saying, you know, if I'm doing regression modeling, it's not just about producing confidence interval. I know that these regression models fit, for example, right? And um, with somebody else I talked about earlier, which again, I, I'm, I'm in part, I'm reflecting what I've heard over the last uh, uh, day and a half and the people that I've spoken with, but this is, these are many things that I've already talked about in many other talks, right? And the idea that we have to be able to reverse the privacy protection mechanism, not for the sake of re-identifiability, but for the sake of supporting inference about the, the, the underlying uh, population that we're interested in making inferences about, okay? And this is a principle that has been around for a long time in SDC or, or, or DP or whatever terminology you want to use, okay? Um, so understanding and a coupling of errors. I think, again, we have heard a lot about the importance of uh, understanding and uncoupling of errors. What, again, for me, what's important is there are many, many different sources of errors. Coverage error, response bias, coverage bias, missing value, zeros, undercounting, right? The list goes on and on. And what is privacy error? It's just another source of error. I, I, from my perspective, I really want, want us to think about privacy error as another source of error, okay? Um, and so now we're just adding in an extra parameter. We're adding an extra dimension. Again, that makes the problem more complicated, but in part, again, what formal privacy has brought in, and specifically differential privacy, are some good properties arguing for transparency uh, in how we introduce this additional error into the system, okay? Um, why is this important to understand the error? Well, even if there is no privacy, in statistical modeling, statistical inference, we worry about how do we account for error due to response bias, missing values, coverage errors, how do we account for that at the final inferential result? Okay. 
And so what I'm really advocating here is that just continue doing what we're doing, but we do have this additional dimension of error that we have to consider. Now, it sounds simple, but again, that's why there are many different research problems, right? Um, in, in, in relation to that, uh, I wanted to suggest, because it was also about you know, maybe suggesting problems, Actually, can we finish the first round of self-introductions? Sure. Okay. You, you. I thought you wanted me to go to, through slides or? The, the proactive stuff would be now and then the okay, reactive. Okay. Then, then, then I'll come back to the slides. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in that case, I will come back to, to, to my slides in a bit then. Uh, I will just end there and um, I will just want to say that we should not shy away from good properties that formal privacy has introduced and um, I will come back and, and uh, comment more on that later. Okay. Thanks. I, I, sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you wanted uh, all the slides. It's my fault. Okay. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Rebecca Wright. Okay, and I do not have any slides. Um, so, uh, hi everyone, uh, I am Rebecca Wright. I am a professor of computer science at um, Barnard College, uh, which is a women's college associated with Columbia University. I'm uh, leading the creation there of Barnard's own computer science department. Um, I'm happy to talk at length with any of you separately about uh, what I'm doing there, which I'm very excited about. Uh, my research is in the area uh, broadly of security and privacy. And um, over the years, I've done some work in differential privacy, including um, things like differentially private algorithms for um, classification and anomaly detection, uh, and uh, pan-private algorithms based on statistics on data sketches, as well as um, looking towards uh, use in more practical uh, scenarios. Uh, so differentially private modeling of human mobility based on location data, uh, traces such as mobile telephone data, as well as um, a uh, prototype for practical deployment of a database query system or a virtual um, distributed database system based on differential privacy or uh, providing differential privacy and secure multi-party computation. Um, so I think um, also uh, some of what, I, what I'm, you know, the lens through which I'm, I'm uh, observing or participating in this entire workshop is that I was director of DIMEX for many years until a few years ago. And, um, you know, I really uh, value this kind of workshop. I think there's a lot of importance uh, for workshops like this in crossing boundaries, which I think is um, really the goal of this workshop and, and just always such an important um, step in bridging from, uh, from research to practice or across different research communities um, to build that common vocabulary and, um, and trust that you get with, with, the, um, with the human connection. It's great to see sort of that in-person connection, at least partially here for this workshop, um, as well as for setting research agenda agendas um, that then can be uh, worked on. And um, so uh, just briefly, some of the, um, the examples where DIMEX has had this kind of role of bridging communities to really make advances or contribute, help contribute to advances across research communities and practitioner communities include um, going back as um, far as the early 1990s, computational molecular biology, um, algorithmic game theory, uh, differential privacy, uh, and also algorithmic foundations of the network, uh, of the internet, um, and more broadly algorithms in the field. And um, so I think for this intro part, I'll just uh, finish by saying that I think this, you know, this workshop really has seemed to, to have been a really vibrant um, conversation and set of interactions. And I think um, we just need to continue to build and strengthen this bridge between um, at least sort of the, the differential privacy research community, the statistical research community, uh, the statistical practitioner community, and um, policymakers. And, um, you know, I think this has been a really uh, good and important step. And, um, you know, I think a lot of the rest of this conversation is supposed to be specifically about advancing the research agenda. So um, I will look forward to the rest of our conversation. Thank you, Rebecca. Next is um, Nancy Potok, whom I am meeting for the first time. Um, okay, so I, I do have um, some slides that I'd like to do some screen sharing with to briefly um, do um, some a short proactive. So let me bring that up if I can. Um, 
I don't see my screen yet. I'm sharing though. Let me start the slideshow. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. Um, let me yes. briefly introduce myself then. Um, so I'm Nancy Potok. Um, my, I have both experience inside and outside of government. My most recent government position was Chief Statistician of the United States, where um, I was responsible for the, all the federal statistical agencies, really, in the coordination and policy around that, and spent a lot of time um, looking at evidence-based policy and developing a federal data strategy, um, as well as um, trying to do my best to help the Census Bureau keep the 2020 Census on track. Um, because prior to that, I was the Deputy Director of the Census Bureau um, and held a variety of positions actually in the Census Bureau and have worked on the 2000, the 2010, and the 2020 Census in some capacity, um, either at the Department of Commerce or at OMB or at the Census Bureau. And when I was the Deputy Director of Census, I chaired the um, Data Stewardship Committee that was responsible for setting a lot of the disclosure avoidance um, policies and um, thinking about these privacy issues and um, I think that's that is a lot of the lens that I'm looking at this through is um, sort of more of a system-wide approach even though the focus here is on the 2020 census differential privacy noisy file so here's just a few thoughts um, that I had that I want to run through quickly um, before we get on to the larger discussion, because it's a broader framework, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems that have gotten presented all through the course of doing the census and um, afterwards, and, and things identified by the panelists. Um, and I think these are all questions, you know, how accurate does the census need to be at these various levels of geography through these different dimensions? Are these new problems or old problems? Um, are there alternate sources of data for purposes um, that are fit for use where you don't have to really depend on the census data? Are these political problems or technical problems? And is there sort of a one-size-fits-all solution? Um, and I think, you know, the way that I've looked at this at least, and I'd like to put this out there, is this, you know, in the utility privacy protection balance, um, we don't have a balance either, either in sort of deciding where are we on the spectrum between utility and privacy protection. And um, if you're not in the Census Bureau, you have like pretty much no say in that when it comes to census data. Census holds all the cards, all of them, um, and can respond or not as um, the people in charge of the Census Bureau feel is appropriate. So on the utility side, you know, we do have, we've heard a lot of use cases, the priority uses, an act actual constitutional mandate, it's hard to beat that, um, these equity issues around voting rights and who gets money and the visibility of certain populations. And then, of course, evidence-based policy making and access to data for researchers um, kind of tilted against these Title 13 requirements that are all-encompassing for the Census Bureau. If you, have, if you talk to, to the Census Bureau about privacy, it's all about Title 13 requirements. Um, but these trust issues are really important and they really came to the forefront for the 2020 census because of all the political interference. Um, but there's like, does the public trust the government in general? Does it trust the, the Census Bureau specifically? And then do the data users trust this idea of legitimacy of the data and is it fit for use? And then, of course, um, there is that need when you're the government to make sure that data is not going to be abused or misused for nefarious purposes. That's a big responsibility. I think the Census Bureau takes it seriously. Certainly, I took it very seriously as the chief statistician. So in thinking about this, um, you know, what are the solutions? Well, there's multiple paths um, that I we've heard things about, but I really believe in these and think they need to be explored if we're talking about research agendas. So um, stakeholders really need to think seriously about using other sources of data, especially state data. Um, I mean, there's a lot out there. The states are really interested, um, particularly if you're, if you're somebody who's interested in your state or consortium of states. Um, you know, start really 
um, doing the, the research to say where can we substitute, where does this make sense without the Census Bureau being in the middle of it. Um, and um, something that I really think has to be put into the privacy research agenda is more exploration of privacy in context. There are folks out there who really um, have done a lot of work in thinking about privacy as, you know, it depends on the context. It's not all or nothing and it doesn't always fit the same. And to me, the big example is the master address file at the Census Bureau, which is covered under Title 13. I can't for the life of me think of any reason why the master address file has to be protected by Title 13. But because it's in the Census Bureau, and that's the way Title 13 is written, it is. Um, and, you know, the circumstances are different. There, there actually is not much data in the Census that, that you can't find online in about 10 seconds or less about people, um, probably more accurately sometimes than the Census. Um, so thinking about why are we doing all this, what are we really protecting, I think is important, and how much do people care about that. Um, and I also think that the research effort on this really has to be more coordinated and sustained and funded in a way that's sustainable, and it should happen outside of the Census Bureau, not just depending on the Census Bureau to really do all the heavy lifting on this, but that's going to require more access to data. But also, most importantly, amend Title 13. So if I had a magic wand, which I wish I did, I would first thing I would do is amend Title 13 because I feel like so much of this frustration and and you know what do we do and how are we gonna meet all of these needs, it's because we've created this box and everybody is like banging against the walls of the box. And I would say, well, maybe we need to change the box as opposed to just doing this deep dive and assuming that they have, those walls don't change. They need to change. They're completely out of date. It's crazy. And there's two things that have to happen. One, the Census Bureau has to be given a lot more independence as a statistical agency so that the President and the Secretary of Commerce do not have the powers that they currently have to interfere in the integrity of the data. Once you do that, then you can roll over into more trust in which case you can start to think about privacy in a more contextual way and relax some of these very stringent Title 13 provisions that don't make sense in an environment. Yes, you have to protect privacy and prevent abuse, but no, the master address file does not have to be in there. And so it's a, there's a, several things that have to come together, but Title 13 has to be amended to do that. And how do you do that? How do you get that kind of consensus, official seal of approval, get Congress to take action to do that? I, I would suggest maybe establish a commission to look at Title 13 over the next 12 months. I, I chaired the um, ASA committee that looked at the quality of the 2020 census um, for purposes of um, apportionment, not redistricting. And that was one of our recommendations, was to go back and re-examine Title 13 and maybe have a commission, a presidential commission, a congressional commission to look at that. Um, and that has to also then set out this national research agenda, um, looking at these technical, social, and methodological um, issues and how they come together and, and help conduct that outreach with the public in plain English to get input and to make this a much more interactive process, not some kind of black box process that takes place in the Data Stewardship Committee at the Census Bureau with the half a dozen people. And then go ahead and amend Title 13 as soon as possible. As soon as it's feasible, get it done because the planning for the next census is underway. And if the census doesn't know by 2024 what the Title 13 parameters are, it becomes really difficult to plan. So what should be in the research agenda? Um, I, again, I'll go back to test alternative sources of data for appropriate use cases. The census group cannot be all things to all people for all purposes. It's just not going to work. So if you have a very local purpose, instead of trying to force the Census Bureau into a peg that it's never going to fit in, 
of having the most accurate data at the block level so you can figure out what's going on on a block in your city. If you're in that city, maybe you have a better data source. And it always boggles my mind a little bit. I'm not picking on anybody. But I know when I was at the Census Bureau, people from local communities would come in and show me data that says, look, this is what's actually happening on the ground. You need to fix your data so then we can turn around and use it. And I'm like, if you already have the data and you want us to correct what you have, why don't you just use what you have? Why are you trying to change the whole Census Bureau? Because it's difficult to do that. Um, but the public attitudes, a lot of research remains to be done on public attitudes. They're very complex, they change, um, and again, these different dimensions of trust. If we're going to build that bridge to looking at contextual privacy, that research has to continue. The methodology, wow, I was just bowled over by things that people are doing that they presented um, yesterday and today, but you guys, who are doing that kind of research need more access to the historical files so you can test your models. If you can't get the 2020 census data, then you need the 2010 or the 2000. Um, and you need survey data. You need to test multiple use cases. Um, getting more access to that data is really important to improving the methodology and start looking at you know automated ways to validate and do quality control. Um, I mean, this question, do specific blocks even make sense? Like, why are people doing things at the block level again? Do you, do you need that? And then um, I think, think Census Bureau can put operational paradata out there. That was another recommendation of the quality, uh, 2020 Census Quality Task Force. Put that operational paradata out to the research community in the public domain because Knowing more about how the data were collected, you know, where were the proxies, where did you have to, um, you know, where was there a lot of missing data, where, where was the, you know, 100% response on the internet. That's very important to understand the quality issues that then play into well, what do you have to do with privacy. Like if you have really bad data to begin with, do you really apply the same privacy protections on data that's mostly by proxy or imputed as you would do for, you know, 90% internet response. I mean, and who's, who's making those decisions? So more transparency is, is really imperative in the research agenda. So I think that's my last slide. I will just stop there. Um, but again, I mean, I, I'm just advocating for Let's, let's change the parameters of the box in addition to kind of really doing this deep dive into accepting those parameters and just trying to perfect within that box. Because I think the box needs to be changed. Thank you, Nancy. Next, we have Raj Chetty. Thanks so much, uh, Cynthia. So I just want to check, can people see my slides here? Yes. Yes, yes. great, excellent. So uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to join this workshop on what are clearly critical issues for lots of fields, including the social sciences, which is going to be the perspective that I bring to this. I'm a professor of economics at Harvard. Uh, and I see myself as basically an end user of the types of noisy statistics that this uh, conference has been focused on. So what I thought I'd do in the, in the five minutes I have up front here is just make three observations from an end user's perspective um, in thinking about uh, these issues of uh, disclosure avoidance and so forth. And I'm going to start with first a, a very simple observation that I think many uh, people here will, will share and other speakers have, have already pointed out, but I just want to illustrate that in a very specific example, which is that Noise infusion has clear practical advantages over traditional disclosure avoidance methods, which tend to have much more opaque statistical properties. And this really became clear to me and uh, folks in my research group uh, here at Harvard when we were working on uh, releasing, in collaboration with the Census Bureau, something that we call the Opportunity Atlas, which is a set of statistics uh, at the census tract level constructed by combining tax data with census data. Uh, a longitudinal data set that basically allows you to look at various outcomes for children who grew up in different neighborhoods around the US. And so I'm just giving you 
one illustration here. I mean, you can look at these statistics if you're interested at opportunityoutlast.org. Here's just a snapshot for illustration of the Atlanta area, where we're looking at teenage birth rates, which you can infer from uh, tax records, for women who grew up in Atlanta in low-income families, parents earning $27,000 a year. So we compute these statistics for, for every census tract. There's some statistical methodology in the background that I won't get into. A key interest for, for, for this group is how do you release these statistics you know, without compromising uh, individual privacy for, for people who grew up in any of these tracks. And so we worked closely with uh, the Harvard uh, Data Privacy Tools uh, group and Salil Badan and colleagues in, in particular <laughs> to develop some methods in order to do this. So what I want to focus on is how this noise infusion approach that we ended up using, I'll say a little bit more about uh, later on, ends up being quite valuable relative to other methods of disclosure avoidance that one might have thought about that we were considering before we began working with Salil and his colleagues and Johnny uh, and others. So just to illustrate that, so suppose I'm interested in the following question. I'm, I'm trying to figure out you know, what is driving the variation in the map that I just showed you. You know, why is it that you have much higher teenage birth rates in some places than in others? Uh, one pattern that you see as illustrated in this bin scatter plot here is that, and this is just literally taking the data from the map that I showed you, uh, and correlating that with single parent shares in each track, you can see that there's a very strong positive relationship where girls who grow up in neighborhoods with more single parents tend to be more likely to have teenage births themselves. And this plot in particular, we're drawing for black women who grew up in low income families. Okay, so this is the truth. We're actually constructing this using the noisy data that we released publicly, but we had access to the data internally at the Census Bureau, and we know that this is very close to what the true relationship actually looks like. Now let's consider a different approach. Suppose instead of doing noise infusion, I do something else that would seem very intuitive. I basically suppress small cells, and in particular, the suppression method that we considered is dropping cells where you have fewer than five uh, teenage births, which is a type of method that you know traditionally is uh, something that many people have used. So suppose I did that and did not uh, focus on noise infusion. What would I get if I constructed the same plot? I would get this, which is no relationship between teenage birth rates and the share of single parents. So as you can see, you get the answer totally wrong. Um, and what is going on intuitively, there are two things, one of which I think is fairly obvious. If you drop the cells with very few teenage births, then as you go to the left side of this chart, you're going to have more cases where you have fewer than five teenage births. That gets dropped. And so you're dropping the cells with particularly low teenage birth rates. And thus, that's going to flatten the relationship because those cells appear with higher frequency in, in low uh, single parent share areas. So that is something maybe you would have guessed if you had gotten this kind of suppressed data. You might be able to fit models with censoring to figure out like what the shape of that tail looks like, even if you have data only above five teenage births, and maybe that's a problem you could figure out how to correct. But there are actually more subtle issues going on. And so just to illustrate that, if you look here, here we're plotting teenage birth rates versus the number of black women in each track in below median income families. And what you see is that teen birth rates happen to be very highly correlated with the number of black women who are living in each of these tracks. In particular, they're much lower in tracks that have fewer black women, it turns out empirically in the data. So that is another factor, it turns out, that is leading to the bias that we're seeing here. In particular, these tracks with very few black women also tend to have lower single parent shares, and they tend to be the ones that get dropped. And that would have been extremely difficult to figure out from the counts of rest data on the outside if we had only released that. So basically, the, you know, the data generating process here is complicated enough that if you use things like count suppression or other types of disclosure avoidance methods where the statistical properties are unclear, I think it's very difficult to get reliable, reliable inferences exposed because you basically don't know what the DGP is. In contrast, I think uh, adding noise can potentially lead to statistical inferences that other speakers have pointed out. Um, can, that can be much more reliable and that we can correct. And so that leads to the second point uh, that I want to make, which is, in our experience, the utility of the noise-infused statistics depends greatly on the target estimate. 
So, and I find it useful to distinguish between two different cases from a practical point of view. The first case is where we're interested in low dimensional functions of these noisy statistics, like the example I just gave you, where I was basically interested in the linear regression coefficient, the relationship between teenage birth rates and single parent shares, right? So say this parameter beta, if I'm running an OLS regression of some outcome y on some variable x, and imagine I'm, very, I'm measuring both y and x at the census tract level. So in this case, Suppose I'm only able to release, I'm releasing noisy statistics x tilde, uh, where I'm adding some noise using differential privacy methods or other uh, related methods. So I'm adding some noise eta i uh, to each ob true observation x i at the census tract level. This is what we effectively did in the opportunity atlas. Then it's very straightforward, and this will be familiar, I'm sure, to, to everyone in the audience. If I'm interested in the regression coefficient, which is just the covariance of y with x, divided by the variance of x. I can just do a little bit of algebra, recognizing that because the noise I'm adding is orthogonal to x, the covariance of y with xi tilde is the same as the covariance of y with x. And hence, I can substitute an xi tilde here. And then I know that the variance of xi is different from the variance of xi tilde. Uh, in particular, the variance of xi tilde is larger because I've added this noise on top. But I know the amount of that noise. And hence, you know, in this very simple case, there's just a standard, what's equivalent to a measurement error correction or uh, adjusting for attenuation bias. If I just estimate beta tilde, the regression in the noisy data, I can map back to what the true underlying beta would be by just adjusting for the, the variance of the noise that I've added, which is, of course, a known statistic uh, in these differential privacy protocols. So I think in that sort of case, where we're interested in low dimensional statistics, this is a linear model, so this is really simple to, to show. You know, more generally, in nonlinear models, more complicated settings, basically a deconvolution exercise is going to let you recover what the underlying parameter of interest is. So that's a case that where I think this approach is very practical and, and, and can be very valuable for, for applied users. And of course, that's a lot of what we do in research where we're interested in understanding various covariances, joint distributions of various statistics, and so forth. In contrast, I think there's a different set of applications, often you know, applications not so much on the research side, but I would say on the policy side, on the ground, where people are trying to use these data to make decisions, which I think of as basically being high dimensional functions of these noisy statistics. For instance, targeting programs based on these data that we're releasing. And so again, to go back to the example I was giving you, when we put out these data, part of the purpose was to give guidance to policymakers and to families on the effects of growing up in different neighborhoods. So here I'm again showing you the teenage birth data. We also release similar data for earnings, for example. And those data are literally being used at the moment by HUD and housing authorities around the US to help families move to higher opportunity neighborhoods where we expect their kids to have higher levels of earnings in adulthood. So for that type of application, I literally care about tracked by tracked what is the average level of earnings that I'm seeing? I don't just care about this low dimensional covariance with something else. You know, if I have a lot of noise in these statistics, then I'm literally going to be sending kids to the wrong neighborhoods, or they're going to have worse outcomes than they otherwise would. And so in these cases, my sense is it's much harder to address the problem. You can still do something. For instance, you can use shrinkage estimators to reduce the mean squared error predictions given the noise that you're adding. So you don't just have to directly use the noisy statistics. But my instinct and my experience from working with people in housing authorities, other you know, practical users of these data, is that the acceptable levels of noise become much, much lower. Because at some level, you care about point-wise the level of noise that's in the data, not just the overall covariance, but some other uh, statistic. And so you know, I think there, it becomes very important to think about the trade-off between privacy risk and utility and figure out ways to inject acceptable levels of noise. We were able to rely on a framework developed by John Abad and Ian Schmidt on how to weigh those two things. And in the Opportunity Atlas, basically settled on a level of noise injection that seemed acceptable for the application we were interested in at this in this high dimensional way. So that brings me to the last and final point I want to make, which is I think it would be very useful for the field and uh, lots of folks here who have more technical expertise than I do on these topics uh, to figure out how we can inject acceptable levels of noise for high dimensional applications. And so, you know, some things that come to mind 
what types of robust statistics should we be thinking about? So if you trim outlying observations, or Windsorize outlying observations, we found that to be very useful in the type of data we were releasing that allowed us to control sensitivity, reduce sensitivity substantially, and inject acceptable amounts of noise. I think another set of issues to think about is, are there a set of weaker guarantees that we might be able to provide? Not just thinking about global sensitivity, and I know there's a lot of work being done in this area, but are there other sort of cases where we're not thinking about the absolute worst case scenarios, but empirically what seems plausible? I think it's very important for applied users to feel like they're getting statistics where the level of noise is really acceptable for the applications uh, we're interested in. My sense is that will give a lot more traction and uptake of these sorts of methods. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Raj. Okay, Frauka. Thank you. Um, the advantage of coming forth is you can be very brief uh, because we are, it's comforting to see that we hit a lot of similar issues. I do want to rephrase and bring a couple of other things from the perspective of someone who works a lot in and around actual data collection uh, as part of the joint program in survey methodology at the University of Maryland. We train people in the federal statistical systems uh, <clears throat> for, for many decades and uh, at, here at LMU in Munich. I train the quantitative social scientists of all areas. And those are the two uh, angles that I use to, to comment and suggest research areas. Um, the first point I want to make, and this is supporting a bit uh, Nancy's angle here, um, what, 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 what I've seen a lot when the big data collection projects start, and in a way the census is one of those, right? That uh, once a certain set of data exists, there's a lot of appetite to use this data for other purposes that the original plan or the original design wasn't made for. And that works for a long time and that's cost efficient and every time we have new needs we look at data that exists and then we try to sort of make that fit until it breaks because the original design doesn't longer support these needs. And so I think here too, you know, I, I do wonder if for the applications we are often concerned with with respect to the redistricting what elements and which sensitive elements here are uh, really those that are in need of protection. And um, if many of the other applications that use uh, features and characteristics that are more sensitive or might be more in need of protection um, are actually information needs that happen at a higher level where uh, the noise infusion is easier done. And we've just seen uh, examples in Ray Chitty's uh, quick introduction um, that that can indeed be done. And the question is there, Ray, you mentioned that you guys used the uh, census tracts, but of course maybe these could also be the school districts or um, other somewhat higher level. And so I think that there are advantages in some of these alternative data sources uh, when they come from administrative records or other um, sources. The text data certainly have annual updates and, and many other sources even more frequent than the Census Bureau would have. So I think that is a research area worth focusing on um, and uh, to both think about uh, the, the um, alternatives and then of course what are the risks included in those alternatives. The second point I want to make is that I, I, I'm very much uh, in favor of this entire discussion on the noisy measurement files because I think this this has done a great service to the entire community on focus on measurement error that we know is there. And, you know, plus the noise infusion without the noise infusion, it is there. And it has um, shown a bit of a scary spotlight on many of us educators that we don't train our folks and also those already out there uh, in the community enough to really work with measurement error and include that in the statistical analysis. And I, I mean, not for all approaches, the techniques are there. We have seen that discussion a lot, but I do think even with the ones that are there, um, that it should be known. I agree with anyone who says that, and maybe in economics classes that it's covered, but in many instances it's not, and I think we, we certainly would need to do better there in the future. The third part um, I want to bring up here for the discussion is that I do think trust has come up a few times and um, the, 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 the one piece I want to point out is that, you know, we, this whole chain 
is uh, based on trust in a way, and where we start um, trying to protect is a bit of a signal on where do we think people don't trust each other. And I love this little uh, graph that um, uh, appears in uh, the, this recent paper from Evans et al. Uh, team around uh, Gary King that, that sort of focus on the various elements where you can uh, protect privacy and, and infuse noise. And, we do know from empirical work when randomized responses induced that the respondents often wonder why go overboard with the technology. I'm trusting you, researcher or interviewer, and I, I'm confused and maybe don't trust the technology. And sort of similar things I feel like are part of the discussion that are happening now, plus maybe a little bit of feelings hurt that, that we now might indicate that the researchers working on the files so far are not to be trusted and therefore can only see data that are um, properly protected in that way. So, you know, that uh, I, I think is important to keep in, in the back of our minds when we try to bring the community together to, to work with the new set of data. And lastly, I want to say that um, it, it struck me that we all around seem to be still uncomfortable with uncertainty or um, displaying the uncertainty that is in the data afterwards. And I think there has been decades of culture on focusing on accuracy, because we do think accuracy means the truth, where it seems to me the question could really be, uh, is the decision made afterwards really different with different data? And, uh, and shifting that focus could be a worthwhile additional endeavor. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for those remarks. Some the, your very last point dovetails with some of the things that people discussed yesterday. Um, for example, Sam Hirsch. So uh, finally, we have Janine McLeod. I don't know if I pronounced your last McLean. name. Okay, and um, uh, who will wrap up the introductions and launch our uh, interactive conversation. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Janine Abrams McLean. I am the president at Fair Count. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that focuses on power building through civic engagement. So we do census, voting, redistricting. Um, and we work in a lot of communities that are undercount, historically undercounted in the census. We work in a lot of rural communities. Um, and so a what's been spoken about over the past two days, especially when it comes to the data that are more noisy in those smaller and um, underrepresented communities, really uh, hits home. Uh, before starting Fair Count, um, I was an evolutionary biologist. I guess I still am. And so <laughs> it's been um, very fun to be in this meeting because uh, if you know anything about evolutionary biology, you know we do a lot of Bayesian analyses. You know that we do a lot of maximum likelihood and bootstrap analyses. And so um, I was joking with one of my friends who focuses on Bayesian analyses while I was <laughs> well, um, some of the talks were going on and we were laughing that it was MCMC for life, no matter, um, <laughs> no matter when you, uh, if you change your career. Um, and so for me, this has been really fun. Um, but I come, you know, looking at this from the lens of someone who loves research, understands the importance of research, but also is on the ground talking to people. And I think it's very important, um, and I'm also someone that understands uncertainty. You know, I understand, I get it. I understand that there are going to be un there's going to be uncertainty, but I also know that you have to talk to people in a certain way so that they understand it and they feel comfortable with it. And so being proactive, I think that we really need to think about it as a community of researchers, as a community of, um, as a community of data users, on how do we talk about uncertainty, not only so that data users feel comfortable about it, but about the communities and how, you know, because uh, um, on the panel yesterday with Fred and that, that Jay June led, um, a lot of people, especially around census, um, and not just the decennial, but also thinking forward to ACS, thinking um, forward to 2030, Trust is a big deal when you're talking to folks. And when you start bringing in and people see these, you know, differential privacy is ruining everything and I'm being disappeared, all those narratives impact people. And so I think we really need to be thoughtful about how we talk about uncertainty, how we talk about changes that are happening um, to census and data in, in general, um, but put it in the context of not only the data users, but the people that, are, that we're working with. Um, and if examinations of uh, noisy measurement files can help us figure that out, I'm all for it. Um, 
Again, we need to think towards 2030, we need to think about equity. Um, that has come up several times. So let's think about, you know, make sure that when you're doing your analyses, when you're doing your studies, when you're looking at demonstration products that we're really thinking about um, equity. And uh, for redistricting, uh, we've heard a lot about that. Um, and even though the big redistricting cycles are over, we have local redistricting, um, there will be, you know, mid-cycle or inter-cycle redistricting, whatever you want to call it. But um, as Fred and several people talked about yesterday, it's already hard to prove a Section 2 case. Like, you've got to come correct. And if there are, if there's I just want to make sure that moving forward, if we still have Section 2, because it's under threat right now, but if we do have Section 2, I want to make sure that we are confident in the data and confident in the messaging that we're putting out there to, those, um, to the folks that are using it. Uh, and last, uh, last thing I want to say is about testing. I am all about testing. I'm all about research. And I know that when, um, and there have been some amazing talks today, so kudos to everybody that's, um, that, 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 is, um, that have done these, um, all the work that y'all are doing. Um, but I want to make sure that when you're doing simulation studies, when you're doing modeling analyses, there are lots of ways that you can adjust your parameters to take into account the use cases that we're hearing today. And so I just implore everyone to be thoughtful when you're designing your studies, thoughtful when you're designing your, um, your simulations, and just think about how can, I, how can, you, best, um, how can you best simulate real life instances, real life, um, real life parameters. And I will kick it back over um, for the full discussion. Thank you so much. Great. All right, so um, I've collected some notes from uh, summarizing some of the things that we've been, we've been hearing about. And let me just start. So I think one theme that has been pervasive is the question of measures of uncertainty. And I want to talk about that in a bit more detail. So there's a kind of computational aspect of it, and there's a communication aspect of it. So um, for the computational aspect, we are interested in things like measures of uncertainty as a function of the privacy parameter and how to combine them. And that would be sort of either based only on the differential privacy parameters or based on the combination of the DP parameters and other sources, including post-enumeration surveys, demographic analysis, and other public data sources such as prisons and their monthly, uh, their monthly published counts as described by Karen McDonald um, for California. So does anybody want to comment on, like th there was quite a bit of discussion on specific things that we might try to do in this general direction. Does anybody want to bring anything up uh, that was not covered or maybe actually, Amy, could you just say something briefly, or Adam, uh, or Mark, say something briefly about these measurements of uncertainty that you were talking about in your slides at the end? Because I think that's, um, you know, th those are concrete questions. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, sure I can, I, I guess, I'm not sure I have, at this point, too much to add on what all the things people have said over the course of the workshop, but just, just, reinforcing the, you know, other than reinforcing the importance of understanding these things. And um, certainly as a researcher, my temptation is to say, well, people on the ground should be more proactive about, you know, stating and, and trying to understand what sources of uncertainty they have, they're dealing with in, in their data. Um, and then, you know, then the additional uncertainty, you know, added, say, by census won't look so ridiculous. but. I'm, I, I really, you know, I also appreciate the, the, the sort of alternative perspective that was offered by a number of people about just the complexity of that and, and the complications it introduces. And I'm, I'm honestly not sure where I, how, you know, how I feel, personally feel about this at this point. But I certainly think that, like, overall, we need better principled ways to, you know, if we're, we're increasingly using data for all sorts of decisions, and if we're not understanding the 
mistakes we're potentially making in doing that, then you know clearly we're asking for problems down the road. So right. um, I guess I so don't know. I'll, maybe I'll, I'll hand off to others. I just want to just want to comment that what we saw in session two was a dis was a distillation of the. Uh, you know, problems of, of, of estimating the accuracy for linear things and for, for ratios and so on. But so far, I didn't hear anybody say, and how would the, uh, what role could these auxiliary sources of information play and how would they factor into the analyses? So that seems new that we could bring in for future work. Amy? I guess I would hope that from session two, you heard that you can't just get rid of using blocks. And if census said, we are not going to publish blocks, all of the users would adjust, because they'd have to, and they'd use block groups, right? I mean, that's, that's the bottom line, but that hasn't happened yet, and so a bunch of information has been put out that people are now putting under a magnifying glass and saying, look at these crazy things. But what I'm, I'm curious about with the, the purpose of the workshop what could be released? Like what sort of noisy measurements file do we want? Do we want something that looks just like the PL so you can do a side-by-side -side comparison? Or do we want something that has different stages of what census actually did to the data? Like do you want a little bit of information or a lot of information? And Michael and I have been talking about this now for the past two days. It is enormously complex just to even ask that question once that question is answered, I just want to make sure that it isn't an academic toy, that someone creates the tooling so that the people on the ground have something to use. And not something like even the demonstration data products get, that get put out. It takes these guys hours to even load the data. So these are people that they have work to do and they need to be able to explain to people in their communities, in their states, how to use the data. So, you know, just once we make all of these important decisions, how are we going to have that translation piece? And I think that especially today's talks have been fascinating, but so much of that work is still theoretical. And so I'm not even talking about going from theory to application. I'm talking theory to application to user interface so that this actually has the take up you expect. But mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if that's what you were looking for, Cynthia, but that's what I, mm -hmm. what I have. Anybody want to comment on that? Michael, did you want to follow up at all? I'll wait. Okay. <laughs> all right. Excellent points. Cynthia, can I add something? Sure, please. So one of the things that I uh, wanted to say, which had to do with errors, um, and I believe in my discussion with Michael, perhaps census has already done some of it. Um, one, I had a question yesterday. How are demographers at the moment accounting for errors? Let's look at that methodology. Then let's compare and see, is there a minor adjustment that needs to be done, right, once we introduce privacy noise? And again, we can put that in the context of noisy measurement file, right, as, as, as needed. The second one, uh, for, for one of the later discussion sessions, there were a lot of use cases that were presented, as Janine um, uh, indicated. Mm -hmm. um, we have tools or environments um, some call it agent-based modeling, but think about simulations. We can use the qualitative and ethnographic information that we collect to play with these parameters of what these potential error sources look like and to basically create, in a way, a partially hypothetical world of, you know, depending what these information that we have or what the errors look like, how does that play into and interact with the noise, the privacy errors, errors due to privacy? Um, my understanding from Michael is that census did a little bit of that, um, but I think this is a an in, very interesting, from my perspective, research agenda that, that somebody can pursue because it would bring together the voices uh, from different communities and, and, and elements like this, as I said, qualitative information with ethnographic information that we can potentially try to introduce in this so-called simulated environment. Mm -hmm. uh, climate scientists, modelers do this very often. So something along those lines. Um, and I think another interesting thing that we, we can, when we think about the errors, um, uh, somebody talked a little bit about this, but uh, we talked about this 
long time ago, privacy by design. There, there's multiple meanings to that. But again, thinking about introducing privacy early in the process, and this could be also explored in this potential simulation environment, right? But it's about if you want to have a particular output, maybe I, I introduce privacy while I'm sampling, stratified sampling or whatever I'm doing. Um, there's maybe some, no, some way of going about that rather than waiting to the end to introduce privacy, right? Data collection process. Think about privacy in the data collection process. This is not a, a novel <laughs> idea. We, you know, we, we've done things like this, but now with the fo within a framework of formal privacy, think about something like that. And again, that touches on the errors mm -hmm. again. So that, that's what I wanted to add. Excellent. Hmm. Any other comments or someone want to bring up another theme? I have one that I really want to touch on, but I'm going to wait because I had the mic first. So. Hmm. All right. Um, okay, so Sam Hirsch asked a question yesterday. Sam said that the error from DPA is different because it is not a question of something being hard to measure, but rather something affirmatively and intentionally injected. However, this ignores swapping. So we had swapping. We had things that were affirmatively and intentionally injected. Why didn't this come up before? Why is it special now? Um, so we, can we build strong measures to argue that the situation is now better, or if that's not the case, how much worse it is? So can we have some discussion on that point? This is touching on something that comes up over and over again. People say, oh, there's noise, or whatever, and then the uh, other people say, yeah, but there's been noise all the time, and you get noise of this kind and noise of that kind, and there's not a comparison of the noises or whatever. How do we, how do we keep the conversation? I don't want to use the word honest, but I want, to, I want to somehow capture that to fully understand the consequences of the decisions and the policies, we need to understand what they're being compared to, or at least I feel this way. Maybe other people disagree. Can we have some commentary on that? I do think when it comes to the, or when you, and I'm new to this space, as I said, but it did seem that when differential privacy came, you know, and it was, it wasn't top down algorithm, it wasn't disclosure avoidance in the news, it was differential privacy. And I think because the, you know, you're building the plane while you're flying it, you're testing it, you're doing these demonstrate, you're looking at demonstration products, you're figuring out and working out the kinks of, of what this, of what the, what everything is going to look like. And then you have the spotlight on one of the most chaotic censuses that has ever happened. I think that's why before all of a sudden people are like, well, they're doing this new thing. And then people talk about, well, they put noise in the data before. But no, but it wasn't, I think the stakes were higher and there was just a little bit more light shown on, on differential privacy. But I do think that going back to this whole idea of messaging and talking about it, I do think it's important to, you know, to, to put that in context and to tell people, look, this has been, and I know this is what the Census Bureau has been doing. I know that advocates have been talking about this and writing things up to tell people, but maybe it just needs to be said in a different way or maybe, but I, you know, I just, I think going back, I think it is because of the context of the 2020 census um, that that's why people have started asking questions before, at least from my perspective. Yeah, Cynthia, also when you have a chance, I, I, can, I want to jump in too. Right, uh, Rebecca and then Nancy. Uh, Nancy is probably more of an expert on this than I am. I was just going to say, I do remember, um, uh, in some of the, the conversations that were early for me around swapping and sort of understanding those um, disclosure limitation uh, methodologies is that they were partly designed with some very specific end goals in mind, like not changing means too much of certain, you know, census related, so blocks and things like that. And so I think the way those techniques were designed came from some goals designed around how the Census Bureau and, its, and users of its products think about data, it, whereas differential privacy came in really with sort of the privacy goals and, and um, 
utility as, as part of it, but not sort of these very specific uh, u utility um, methodologies or, accurate or, or concepts. And so I, th I think it's, it's just coming, coming at things from a different direction. Differential privacy gives formal privacy guarantees, but, but sort of didn't have certain kinds of um, other goals baked into it. Um, but like I said, uh, it's, it's possible that, uh, that someone else can say more uh, definitively than I can. Thanks, Rebecca. I just want to emphasize that my question is on what do we say sort of moving forward? It's not like why did it happen as much as, you know, is, is, is connecting it to what happened in the past the, uh, the right direction to, for communicating? I know that Nancy wanted to say something. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, looking forward, I think there are a lot of lessons learned from what happened with 2020, and it would um, be a shame not to take advantage of that. I think, um, you know, Census did something really bold um, in, in adding this dimension of transparency and, and actually reaching out and engaging the user community. Uh, but the messaging was uh, left a lot to be desired and created confusion, and particularly um, because of the progression of improvement. So when you start with something that's really awful and that message gets out there, it's hard to correct it. So I think going forward, um, there has to be a lot more care about vocabulary, education, socializing people in examples that people can understand. I mean, I have to admit, even for myself, like the discussions that went on about differential privacy initially took me a long time to really understand what does that mean? What are the implications? And how would that filter through the whole federal statistical system um, if census does this? And um, it could have been, you, you know, I think the use cases are really good illustrations. Um, and so thinking about what are the use cases that can illustrate um, sort of the benefits of differential privacy, how it can protect people, and illustrate for the users when it's appropriate and when, when you might want to not use the data. It might be too noisy if you absolutely have to do everything at a block level. Um, you have to understand what you have. And I think sort of the plain English resonating messaging that's done with the view to communicating to the general public as opposed to other statisticians, which is I think what Census Bureau was doing initially, was really a very technical, complicated discussion um, and then putting out super noisy data, which is not helpful. Um, but I, you know, I, I still appreciate what they were trying to do in that transparency. So I, I would just say my advice would be really bring in um, the community and um, really talk to the people who are going to be affected by it and figure out what it is, how to, how to craft that conversation in a way that touches on the things that people actually care about versus getting into, you know, some people will care about a deep dive into the methodology, but, but not the community and not the people who have to actually like respond to the census. Um, I would just like to add to what Nancy said, shout out to Ray Teddy for giving these two examples uh, with the regression graphs, right? The noise infused and the swapping. I think that's the kind of communication, Nancy, that you're talking about that speaks directly uh, to the kind of quantitative researchers that work with the data and you know the, I, I think I think that was a, a great example for what 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 you just said Nancy great Sasha yeah oh and, uh, sure, wait, wait a second just uh, yeah, go ahead go ahead Jijun and then Sasha will speak There's, oh, okay, now it's on. Um, so I think there are two things, and it's been brought up to some extent, I think, by um, the panelists. But I think the first is the transparency that differential privacy brings was certainly a benefit, but we just weren't ready for the discussion. I think that was said by Nancy, but I just wanted to put it that way. And the second thing was, 
I think when we talk about differential privacy, what I find in the conversations I've been, it's actually a much deeper conversation. I think some of the issues that have come to fore are why do we hold certain characteristics invariant in the past that we didn't do it now? Things like total population down to the block level. I think that's been one particular pain point uh, that's come up in a lot of these analyses is that doesn't seem particularly private. And so I think it goes to a very deeper, more perhaps philosophical question of why do we keep things in very, uh, why do we keep things private or not? And that's what we really mean when we talk about differential privacy sometimes is, is thinking about these larger questions of what does Title 13 really say? And I think unless those kind of questions are resolved, I think it's going to be a continuing source of tension. And I think that's why people also call on the need for Congress to kind of weigh in whether we all think that's a good idea or not. That's, I think, a, a separate question. But I think just the need for guidance and some sort of, um, I don't know, uh, judgment, perhaps, on that deeper question is needs to be tied up, I think. Thanks. Uh, then, Sesha, and then maybe we can say something about uh, the guy with the Sharpie. <laughs> Okay, so I think I just wanted to add to, to, to the last few points. Um, I am in full agreement what we have to do is to communicate uh, with a larger community with very, very simple examples. Um, and here I'm saying, you know, in swapping we trust, I guess I should have said that explicitly. Um, this is a very simple example of, of a, 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 for those who, who, who work, they, they know this uh, work in paper 22. Um, this is a, a fictitious example, uh, four by four, county level and uh, level of ed educational level of the head of the household that is the number of delinquent children. Um, this is the original table. This is a swap table how uh, agencies said, this is how we swap. This is an example of a swap table. If I only care to do statistical inference on are these two nominal random variables uh, independent, which what, um, was mentioned earlier, like what is the objective of the analysis, there's no difference in my inference between the original table and the swap table. This is what your chi-square statistic and the likelihood ratio statistics are pointing here. But if I'm interested in capturing linear association within this, t this table, capturing maybe ordinality in these variables, possibly, one very simple statistic is something is called mental Hensel statistic. Original table, I'm claiming, based on my inference, there is no asso linear association between the, the head of the educational level of the head of the household and the county that you're coming from. However, if I use a swap table, I'll go by, I hate p-values, but <laughs> I'm reporting them. It, gives, it tells you there is a, a, significantly, uh, um, a significant association in this table. That's a total reverse of statistical inference. Why is that the case? Well, because when the swapping was done, we had to preserve the margins. We didn't think about that this will be a potential use for the data. So again, a very, very simple example. We have much more, more examples like this actually in the paper, like going back some 10 years ago. Um, there relates to a lot of other work, but I, I feel like we do, we keep talking about doing something like this, communicating, but I feel like right now we really do need to communicate simple examples. Swapping, suppression, Raj's example was also great. So that, that's the point. And then whatever you wanted to do next. <laughs> well, um, we'll, we'll have to stop very shortly. So I just, I wanted to bring up the guy with the Sharpie because it's a problem that a lot of, I think a lot of the computer scientists and statisticians maybe just weren't aware of. And it seems that it's not completely out of reach. So I think this is a good note to end on because it is a direction for future research in which we can actually expect to have solutions. And I, I gather it will be widely useful, maybe not just in Michigan even, uh, with the neighborhoods that bisect the tracts, but other, other settings as well. I was uh, astonished over the last year or two to learn about all of the different ways things are broken up and the fire districts and the sewer districts and the school districts and the local voting and so on and so forth. And I think that all of these would benefit from thinking about the problem of the guy with the Sharpie. So that's where I'd like to end. If anybody wants to make a comment on that problem in particular, uh, this is a good time and um, yes. No. <laughs>
All right. Well, in that case, uh, let me thank um, all of you for being here. Let me thank the participants in this session and the previous sessions. I also want to thank the following uh, people specifically. Here at the hotel, Jason Farber, who's our contact person who took care of everything and who fed me my independent meals away from everybody else. Bo Kennedy uh, from our tech support on site, Christina Dosha, um, and at DIMAX, David Pennock, Tamara Carpenter, Nicole Clark Johnson, Chris Passione, Mark Anderson, and Walter Morris. Thanks very much to the Rutgers Stats Department, Rong Chen, Harry Crane, and Louis Locuta. And very much thank you to Danny Goroff and the Sloan Foundation for generously funding this workshop. And my fantastic co-organizers, Robin Gong, Wei Jiasu, and Lin Jun Zhang.